So here, uh, chapter 17, the sign of the covenant, uh, the, the circumcision. You see, once you promise the inheritance to Abraham and to his seed, then you must define who the seed is. Now I have to ask a question. Is the Abrahamic covenant unconditional or conditional? Unconditional. It's both. It's unconditional in that it will surely be fulfilled to Abraham and to his seed, but it's conditional to all those who are descended from Abraham because they may debar themselves from inheritance. Does that make sense to you? So it's neither, neither unconditional solely nor conditional solely, but it's both. And Genesis 17 doesn't add an additional condition. It, it simply is defining who the seed is. Does that make sense to you? And the seed have had a physical act carried out on them, but, it, but a boy who's circumcised at eight days is probably not a believer. When I circumcise my son, I am committing myself to raise him in the faith, as it were. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't guarantee he will come to faith, but I, I commit myself to raise him in the faith and to teach him uh, the faith that uh, is the faith of Abraham. Chapter 18, and from this uh, 18, I want to make a comment or two about... Uh, Chapter 18 gives us a glimpse of Abraham's righteousness. Uh, Abraham in showing hospitality to uh, the, the visitors, though he doesn't know who they are at this, at, at initially in the story. It becomes more obvious as the story unfolds. But uh, initially, he doesn't know who they are. He shows uh, uh, hospitality to them. If you've not been in the East, you don't know what, how important hospitality is. I, I'm always amazed. I go, from time to time, I'll visit a pastor in his home in India, and they will not let me out of the house unless I eat something and have some tea. I have to eat something. And, and folks, these poor people are in poverty like we don't know. I just, it's incredible. Uh, it's just astonishing. They will not allow you out of their home, though, unless you eat something. I imagine in Latin America it's that way. How about in Romania? So, sort of, you know, yeah. Yeah, and they want to give a gift to you. Invariably, they want to give a gift, and you should go. If you go to the Orient, if you go uh, into Latin America, uh, gifts are important. Exchange of gifts is an important part of, uh, of uh, hospitality of, of relationship. Uh, you need to plan to bring gifts with you. But the point is that uh, in the ancient Near East, uh, here for Genesis 18, Abraham is demonstrating his righteousness by his, his treatment of strangers. Yes? Does that make sense to you? Now that's crucially important. This passage is crucially important for a couple of reasons. First, because this sets the groundwork. In this event, uh, the promise of a, of a son through Sarah is given. Yes? Um, and then Abram pleads for Abraham now. Chapter 17 gets his name changed. Uh, Abraham pleads for Sodom. There's an interesting passage here, so let me, uh, 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 let me point you to verse 22. There are 18 places in the Old Testament where the scribes tell us that they intentionally changed the text. This is one of them. They are called tikkune, the changes, sophirim of the, of the scribes. All right? There are 18 places where they tell us they intentionally changed the text, and 1822 is one of them. Uh, the two men turned and headed towards Sodom, but Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Uh, they tell us in, I think it's in the Talmud, that they, uh, they changed the text from saying, the Lord stood before Abraham to Abraham stood before the Lord. Now we will, th we will say, why would they make bother to change the text that way? To stand before someone means to put yourself at, at someone's service and to, and to put yourself in the position of a servant. Uh, they didn't want to associate the concept of the Lord as a servant to a man. And so they, they switched the names, Abraham stood before the Lord. But it seems to me important to retain the original reading here. The Lord stood before Abraham. How is it that Abraham feels free to ask for the life of Sodom from God? Because God has put himself at the service of Abraham. And Abraham may ask God for whatever he wants. Hmm. And what does he ask for? Wealth? Power? Influence? 
He, he asks for the life of a city like Sodom. <laughs> what a remarkable man this is. And he negotiates uh, from 50 to 10. Uh, <laughs> chapter 19. Second reason, the, um, the second reason chapter 18 is important is that the hospitality of Abraham sets up the hospitality of Lot. And here is where I see the righteousness of Lot. If, if Abraham is righteous in his hospitality, Lot also is righteous in his hospitality, though it is a compromised righteousness. Lot lived in Negev, then moved down toward Sodom. Now he's living in Sodom, and the men of Sodom say, who made you a judge over us? So he's become a leader in Sodom. He is a righteous man who shows hospitality to strangers but his righteousness is grossly compromised, first because, uh, uh, as becomes evident in the story, when he starts telling his sons-in-law and, and his children and, and his wife about the, the uh, purpose of God to destroy Sodom, they think he's joking. He has apparently not spoken about spiritual things in any kind of serious way so that they could take him seriously. Hmm. Further, his righteousness is compromised. It is the absolute responsibility of a host to absolutely protect the life and, and uh, goods of his guest. But does that necessitate offering his daughters in their place? In the compromised situation in which Lot lives, that probably is the only alternative he has. In any case, uh, 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 Genesis 18 and 19 are crucial uh, again, I say in 19, if the people of God live among the Canaanites and become like them, they will be taken captive to Babylon or by Babylonians, and the man of the covenant is going to have to come and deliver them. Uh, so we're getting this pattern set up in Genesis 19. We're setting for the future. We're, we're setting up Israel to know how to live before God in the land of Canaan. Chapter 20. Um, chapter 20 is not canonical. And therefore, your, uh, your uh, PowerPoint simply skips it uh, wow. entirely. Uh, chapter, tw <laughs> chapter 20, Abraham lies to Abimelech. We've talked about this before, uh, so I, I needn't say much about it. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, uh, point out that um, uh, that point that we made uh, earlier, uh, verse 13, chapter 20, verse 13. When God made me wander from my father's house, I told her, this is what you can do to show your loyalty to me. Every place we go, say about me, he is my brother. Uh, it's true, but it's a half truth, told us a whole truth, and therefore a whole lie. Uh, but also, it's something they've been doing. This is now uh, within the year between the promise of the birth of Isaac and the birth of Isaac. So Abraham is 99. They've been doing this for 24 years. Why are only these two examples Given of the lie, I think these may be the only two times that, that he got caught. You don't keep lying the same lie for 24 years if it quits working. Does that make sense? So, uh, so here you have uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, endangering of the matriarch in chapter 20. Chapter 21, the birth of Isaac. And Hagar is expelled the second time from the, uh, from the uh, family. I should say about Isaac, his name is significant. What's it mean? He laughs. He laughs. Uh, why is that important? Abraham laughed when he got the promise. Why did Abraham laugh? Yeah. But what's, why, did, why does that cause him to laugh, though? I think he does. It's just funny. It's like a funny, wow, that's a weird way you're going to make this happen. Yeah. I think he does believe, and the reason I think he does believe is that God rebukes Sarah's laughter for unbelief. He does not rebuke Isaac, uh, uh, Abraham's. And so I'm, I'm of the opinion that his laughter is in faith, in delight, joy at the promise of God. Sarah's laughter is in unbelief, but then after he's born, she laughs again. And every time they say his name, Yitzhak, uh, if you know the name uh, Yitzhak Perelman, the violinist, uh, that's the same name. Uh, uh, if if uh, every time they say the name, they are reminded of their laughter, both in faith and unbelief, and in delight at the fulfillment of the promise of God. Um, so, uh, chapter twenty-one. But you also have in chapter twenty-one the expulsion of Hagar and uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, the lesson. Look, folks, the son of the bondwoman will not inherit with the son of the free. Galatians chapter 4. Yes? Yep. But further, the, the bondwoman, the bondwoman, the bondwoman is driven out into the wilderness where there is no water and God leaves her to die. Yes? No? What happens? He, he miraculously provides water for a bondwoman who is not a member of the line of blessing. Then what can Israel expect of, his, of God when they're in the wilderness and they're out of water? What God has done in the past is a model and a promise of what he will do in the future, though he's too creative to do the same thing the same way twice. He doesn't miraculously cause a well to appear. He has Moses strike a rock. Or speak to a rock. The, the, uh, the point is that Israel can trust God. If, if God will provide for Ishmael, what will he do for Israel? And this won't be the last time we'll see this message. Again, I say that this book is written for the generation going into the land. It's, it's uh, about the future. It's about how they can trust God, what they can expect of God, uh, and uh, uh, how they can trust him. Genesis 21 also has the encounter between Abraham and Abimelech. Uh, we've already referred to this passage, and Abimelech wants him to swear that Abraham will not deal falsely with him. Why? Because he has dealt falsely with him, and God is with you in all that you do. Folks, you've got to put those two ideas together. How is it... See, God... Uh, now, now, J. Vernon McGee. The, have you ever heard J. Wow. Vernon on the right heel? <laughs> J. Vernon uh, said, God can't use an unclean vessel. <coughs> Hmm? What'd you say? Really? That's what he said. Right. I've heard that all my life. I've heard it all my life. God can't use an unclean vessel. I have to ask the question, is it true? No. How do you know? He's never used anyone but Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's good. That's the best evidence. Uh, in Genesis, he uses Abraham. He is with you in all that you do. And he lies and God is with him. That doesn't make Abraham a clean vessel. Uh, later, we shall see in Numbers, <laughs> the, uh, Balaam's donkey. Is a donkey a clean animal or an unclean animal? <laughs> what is it? Unclean. unclean. God used Balaam's donkey. Yes? Then, can God use an unclean vessel? Sure. Not only can, he does consistently. On what basis can he use an unclean vessel then? First of all, that's, that's the most important, most fundamental answer, because he wants to. He uses them, those whom he chooses. Grace. What is the human characteristic that leads God to use folks? Faith. 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 Right? Abraham is righteous because of? Faith. faith. It is faith that makes it possible for God to say, He walked according to all my statutes, commandments, and laws because he certainly isn't keeping the rules as they will be given in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Are you with me here? We didn't point out that Abraham is a wimp to... Uh, uh, when Hagar says... I'm sorry, when, when Sarai says to Abram, the, 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 uh, the wrong done me is upon you. She is not trying to shift blame. She is saying, you are the responsible party to keep justice in the family. If the, if the family is the police force, then uh, uh, Abram is the policeman to, uh, to arbitrate the relationships between Sarah and Hagar. Do you follow this? So she is saying, you're responsible for dealing with this. You must deal with this. What is Abram's response? You deal with it. You deal with it. I right, do whatever you want. He capitulates his responsibility in, in the family. This is not a man who is a man you want necessarily living next door to you. You can't count on him, but he trusts God. <laughs> and that makes him an acceptable vessel before God. And righteous without works. Aren't we also both sinner and saint? Yes. Simul justus et peccator. So at the same time, 
just and a sinner. Genesis 22. Uh, one of the great commentaries on the book of Genesis is written by Gerhard von Rod. Uh, that was our textbook when I took Genesis here at the seminary. And he said in Genesis 12, God asked Abraham to cut himself off from his entire past. In Genesis 22, he asked Abraham to cut himself off from his entire future. Um, this is one of the great narratives of the Bible. Uh, and it's a great place to see narrative time, how narrative time passes. Times, uh, uh, narrative time is what we would call real time. So for example, in verses 1 and 2, you have real time. The event take, takes as much time as it takes to read it. Then in uh, verses 3 uh, and 4, 3 and 4, uh, you have uh, uh, compressed time so that uh, the, the morning comes, you have the cutting of the wood, the prepare, preparation of the animals, the, the gathering of the servants, and, and a three-day journey in uh, almost an instant. Uh, then you return to real time in verse 5. And look at verse 5 for real time. Uh, so he said to his servants, you two stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go up there we will worship, nishtachaveh, he says. Vnashuva, lakem. Nashuva, the ah ending there is significant. It's what's called a cohortative in Hebrew, and a cohortative can express um, a request, or it can express a uh, strong commitment on the part of the person. And that verb, nashuva, in Hebrew is a first person plural. What is he going to do to the boy when he gets up there? He's going to kill him and make him a burnt offering. Yes? He's got to burn his whole body on the altar. He doesn't have to burn him to ashes, but he does have to burn it, the whole body on the altar. And yet he says, we will worship and we will return. Uh, early in my life, I studied Hebrews. I, I had an independent study uh, to translate the book of Hebrews for a class uh, for uh, in college, and I got to Hebrews 11, and I thought, how in the world did he know, how, how, did, how in the world did the author of Hebrews know that Abraham believed God would raise him from the dead? Uh, and I thought, well, God must just have revealed it to the author, and that, that's all I could handle. Then I got into the Genesis class, and they told me this. Abraham is already confident that Isaac is going to walk back down the mountain. Yeah, because we will return. Even after he's been burned, not only mm -hmm. killed. Yeah, not only killed, but burned. So his body's going to be reconstructed. That's right. And not only so here is Abraham. Why does he wait? Uh, by the way, since Isaac carries the wood, how old is Isaac? About 17 or something. Yeah, has to be in his later teens, maybe early 20s. For ease of math, <laughs> I'm always for ease of math, uh, Abraham is 100 when Isaac is born. Just as an aside here, if I was 20 and my dad was 120 and he came, he built an altar and we're going to make sacrifice, but we have no animal, and he came at me with a rope. <laughs> I think I could take him, at least I think I could outrun him. Yes? So what does that suggest about the relationship between Isaac and Abraham? An incredible relationship between these two men. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, then we come to, to expanded time in the story. How do you answer the question? Verse 7, Isaac said to his father Ab Abraham, My father, what is it, my son? He replied, Here is the fire and the wood, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the offering? How do you answer that question? If you're Abraham, how do you answer that question? Um, when they came to the place God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood on it. Next, he tied up his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand. And here is where we come to, to expanded time. How long does it take to reach out and take a knife? Just a second. Just a second. But here, the time to even read it is longer than the time it takes to do it. So, so if, I were, if I were filming this, I would have that in slow motion. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> and then the angel speaks. Abraham, Abraham, Hineni, here am I. Uh, and uh, the angel um, 
said, do not harm the boy. The angel said, do not do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God because you do not withhold your son, your only son, from me. The word that's translated your only son also means beloved. It's driven home. Isaac is the man of the blessing. Isaac is the one through whom all the promises will be made, and here's an incredible obstacle to the promise. God hadn't, so far as I know, God had said nothing to Abraham about resurrection of the dead. Then how did Abraham figure out about the resurrection of the dead? I don't know. Again, all I can do is offer speculation, but here's my speculation. Abraham is now 100, uh, probably 120. Yes? Uh, he's 120, and God keeps telling him, I'm going to give you the land. And when I say, will Abraham, does Abraham ever get the land? And they, so people will say, well, and his children. I, I, that's not me. I, I don't know. I know I live in a different culture, but that still isn't me. So it may be that, God, that Abraham reasoned, just as he reasoned here, that God would he reason from two facts. Isaac is the seed, and i got to kill Isaac. He reasoned from that to a conclusion, building his faith, God's going to raise the boy from the dead. He may have reasoned from two other facts. I'm getting older and older and older, and I'm getting nowhere near possessing the land. And yet God promises not only to my seed, but to me, that he will give me the land. Then God's going to raise me from the dead, and that's when I'm going to inherit it. And that may be how he, he concluded that there was a resurrection from the dead then folks, learn something more about faith. I can grow in my faith by taking the, taking the what seem to be incoherent statements of God, reasoning from them to conclusions, and, and I can trust God from his apparently incoherent statements. Does this make sense to you? And I risk on the incoherences of God. This, this man is an amazing man of faith. He has grown over the years, 45 years, walking with God before he's ready to cut himself off from his entire future. Bill, yes? I might have missed this point earlier, but um, in a few verses previous, he says, God will, in answering his son, God will yes. provide a land. Uh -huh. That's right. So it seems like he already is aware. Yeah, he's already aware that God's going to do something. I, I can't, exactly yeah, I, I can't tell my son. I'm going to kill you. That's, I, that's where the sacrifice is coming from. Uh, in the story, it appears that the, that the ram was not in the thicket until he stretched out his hand. The ram wasn't there. There was no alternative. There wasn't anything there. The, the, and, and do you have there um, in uh, verse uh, 13, I guess it is, Abraham looked up and saw behind him a ram Caught in, a thick, uh, caught in the bushes by its horns. In Hebrew, there is a word behold, and behold is something that always marks uh, some aspect of surprise either for the reader or for characters in the story. Are, are you with me? So, uh, so the, the apparent implication of that is that the ram wasn't there. There was no alternative for Abraham. Abraham didn't get to the back, uh, top of the mountain and see the ram and see Isaac and think, well, okay, we gotta, we got to go on with, got to obey God even if it means disobeying God. <laughs> no, he, there wasn't any alternative until God made the alternative by having the ram wander into the bush, and it was there. Um, this is one of the grand passages of the, of the Bible, and, and, and it, it's so important. It's called the Akedah, uh, the binding. Uh, it's so important that Jews believe that this, this event made all subsequent animal sacrifice uh, significant. This is what made it significant. We would say it's the sacrifice of Christ. Mind you, God didn't finally ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, but he did sacrifice his own son. You lost your again. Oh, See fish you know. feathers. Okay. Fish. Yeah, I can swear by fish feathers, for the Lord says not to swear by anything in the heavens above, the earth beneath, or the waters under the earth. And since fish do not have feathers, then I may swear by fish feathers. All right. All right. So. There it is. Legal loophole. Yeah, I'm, I'm on sound ground. Uh, <laughs> that's right, because I have great wisdom, great insight. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't have a PhD, by the way. I have a THD, but it's just... just just for truth and advertising. 
Uh, I get to wear the, the uh, scarlet uh, hood instead of the blue ones everybody else has. I have the scarlet ones. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my, my brothers in the back are, are smirking as I say these things. Uh, one, of the, one of the great lessons in Genesis 22 for us and for Israel is going to be ultimately, if you saw it before the, the projector went off, what do you really love about God? Do you love God or do you love his gifts? What, what really matters most? And this will be the great issue for Israel. What, what do you really value in God, his, his person or his gifts? If it's his gifts, then you won't give them up. If it's God, then anything you can give up, you can risk anything on his count. Chapter uh, 22 also has proof that in ancient times, uh, people drank bear's milk. I don't know whether you knew that or not. But verse 23, uh, now Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Uh, these Eight did milk a bear. Um, so I thought you might want to know about bear's milk in, in the scriptures. Chapter 23, we're beginning now to, to move from the generation of Abraham to the generation of Isaac. So we're going to move the generation of Abraham off the scene. Chapter 23, the death of Sarah. Uh, chapter 26, we'll have the death of uh, Abraham. Uh, so we're moving the old generation off. And uh, we have the preparation for the new generation, chapter 24. Uh, mind you, Abraham is the heir of the land, but he must buy a burial place for his wife. <laughs> uh, and, by the way, in this passage, uh, the people call him a prince in the land. Why is he a prince? Well, he's already been, been acting like a prince. He's been protecting the land, Genesis 14, against its enemies. Uh, chapter 24, uh, the legitimate wife for Isaac uh, it's, this passage is both one of our favorite passages and one of the more frustrating passages to read. Uh, what makes it so frustrating to read? No idea? It's so repetitive. I mean, you get, you, Abraham tells his servant what to do, and then he goes and does it, and then we get the prayer. Uh, this is what I'd like you to do, Lord. Then he does it. Then he has to tell the prayer. And we get, hmm, good night. How many times do we have to have this story told? But the repetition is the important part. The repetition for Semitic literature is what seals the message. Uh, there, it is crucial that you marry within the family, within the people who uh, are of the line of the blessing. Don't marry a Canaanite. And it's crucial that you have God's guidance. So the, the servant goes out looking for the guidance of God and he will get it because he will get the blessing of God just the way Jacob gets the blessing and Moses gets the blessing of a wife at a well. So the people will have that sto those stories in their minds and, and the, the uh, servant of, of Abraham finds a wife for Isaac the same way that uh, Jacob and uh, Moses find wives. Uh, this passage also demonstrates that uh, smoking is a very ancient um, practice in the world because she lit off her camel uh, when she came to the <laughs> land. Uh, so <laughs> I knew you want to know these things. I, you, you hear because you want to learn. And so I pass these on to you. Yeah. Chapter 25 <laughs> Chapter twenty-five is the uh, death of Abraham rather than 26. 25, here we have Keturah. And she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Here's some great names if you want names for children. So you can uh, uh, have a, a, a wealth of names for, the, for your kids. Uh, um, Midian is significant here because the Midianites are, there, are, are, is his, are his descendants. And uh, the Israelites are going to encounter the Midianites over and over again. Um, verse 5, 25-5. Everything he owned, Abraham left to his son Isaac. But while he was still alive, Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines. Mm. <laughs> um, the Bible... Oh, goodness. The Bible nowhere prohibits polygamy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't see any stones or tomatoes coming out, so I'll get back in my chair. Uh, 
Say again. Did you say that ex-captain? Yeah, it was out of the chair as well. Can't be a deacon. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but it, but two things that we should say in nuancing that one is. It never presents polygamy in a good light. Always polygamy causes us more trouble than it, than it solves. And secondly, for leaders, polygamy is prohibited. So the high priest, the uh, elders and deacons in the church are not permitted to be polygamous. So you have, uh, you have those restrictions on that, but nowhere does the Bible prohibit polygamy. That has led to all kinds of problems. Our, our assumption that it does has led to all kinds of problems in our missionary uh, efforts. Um, the name of God has been led into reproach by the fact that people have, uh, uh, missionaries have forced men to put away their wives, and often in the cultures there's no alternative left to them but prostitution. And that cannot possibly be a good testimony for Christ. So, uh, so let, us be, let us be aware that the Bible really does not prohibit polygamy. It doesn't present it in a good light. Uh, it's always, it's always uh, uh, damaging in family relationships, but it doesn't prohibit it. Yeah. Concubines either. doesn't prohibit concubines either. Yeah. But a concubine is not uh, a prostitute. She is, uh, in a polygamous society, you have various levels of relationships between a man and a woman. Uh, Sarah, her name means princess. So she is probably a high-ranking person in the culture, and so she will be a wife of the first rank. Then there are wives of second and third ranks who have uh, less expectation for their children in inheritance. And a concubine's children wouldn't have the, uh, anywhere near the same. They would expect to receive gifts as these do, but not necessarily any inheritance from the family. So are they, are they wives? Yeah. They're, but they're of, of such an inferior rank that they, they uh, can't expect any inheritance from the family. Do they, yes. Yes. Yes, and, and God's pattern certainly is monogamy. Uh, that, that, that that's what God uh, holds up always as the best, but He doesn't absolutely prohibit polygamy. Yeah. So you're absolutely right, and I I'm I'm of the opinion that ultimately uh, in the church, uh, in light of the teaching of the Apostle Paul, that we're not even permitted to divorce. And therefore, remarriage cannot even be an issue. Uh, and that's a problematic for me because my parents are divorced and both remarried. And my stepfather is one of the most godly men that I know. I, I'm, uh, this is a great blessing for me. But, but uh, I'm, I just have no basis from Scripture to say that in the church we have the privilege even of divorce. So uh, now that, of course, is controversial and people hold different views on that. But that's my particular view. Uh, chapter 25 not only gives us the death of Abraham, I should add verse 7 is, the, is a description of a... I, now what I'm going to be saying here is going to be a little jarring, <laughs> but, but hold on. It's, it's a description of a blessed death. Hmm. It's hard for us to think of any, of any death as blessed, but verse 7, Abraham lived a total of 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man who had lived a full life. He joined his ancestors. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hethite. Uh, this is a blessed death, and godly people in the rest of Genesis will die this way. So Isaac will die this way, Jacob will die this way, uh, Joseph dies this way. You have your children around you. You, you, you live many years full of life. Everything has been blessing. This is a blessed death. Um, you have in the next part of chapter 25 down through verse uh, 18, the descent of Ishmael. And in Ishmael's descent, how many children does he have? Twelve. There are twelve tribes of Ishmael. Before there are twelve tribes of Israel. <laughs> Uh, shouldn't Israel be getting the blessing? But worldly greatness is swifter than spiritual greatness. <laughs> uh, uh, Ishmael had a, lived a, a total of 137 years. He breathed his last and died. Then he joined his ancestors. That statement probably is an indication of life after death. Um, Jacob will die and be gathered to his ancestors, gathered to his people, and then uh, 40 days later be buried. <laughs> So gathering to your people is probably not a statement of burial. It's probably a statement of going to be with your 
with your family after death. 